Well, thanks, Debbie, and a good afternoon. It's uh, good to see all of you. I'm sure that many of you are probably sick and tired of seeing me and hearing about deductions, but I keep getting invited, so I'll, I guess I'll keep showing up. Uh, but for those of you who are sick and tired of seeing me and hearing me as a consolation, I do have some wonderfully awful Halloween jokes for you today that I will sprinkle throughout the presentation. So I think I've got about 45 minutes, so I'll do my best to get through this material here. You probably, this should be familiar to many of you. I did present on this topic back in spring, and it's largely the same information, but hopefully it's still useful to you. So as I always begin, you know, what is the difference between a deduction, exemption, and credit? And uh, folks use these terms interchangeably all the time. A deduction basically reduces the assessed value that's subject to taxation. An exemption excludes property from taxation and in some cases even assessment. And a credit reduces the tax bill that is due. Uh, so again, the, the terms do mean different things. They operate differently. And so it's important to get the terminology right. Uh, again, some people refer to a homestead exemption. For instance, there technically is no such thing as a homestead exemption. Now, I always have to work in my lawyerly disclaimer here that this presentation, other presentations the DLGF gives in our memos and, and other publications uh, are not substitutes for the law. They are meant to be helpful or informative. And uh, obviously, the Indiana Code always governs. So if, if you're not sure about anything, if you have any questions or doubts, please feel free to reach out to us. We'll do our best to, to give you an answer or to put you in touch with someone who might be able to help you. And keep in mind, too, that uh, your county attorney can be a valuable resource, not just about deduction issues in a pinch, but uh, if you have other legal issues or questions, your county attorney might be a, a valuable resource there. Now, this slide just shows you how deductions work, basically, how they're applied to the property. You start out with your gross assessed value. You always apply the, the standard homestead deduction first, that is, by statute. And then you apply the supplemental homestead deduction. And then after that, there really is no statutorily prescribed order for applying deductions to property. Now, we advise applying the disabled vet deduction last uh, because if there is an unused portion of that deduction remaining after it's applied to the property, that unused portion can be applied toward excise taxes, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So disabled vet should probably be applied last. As you can see, this brings us down to a net assessed value of about $1,290 in this example, and that is the amount to which you apply the tax rate. Now, it is possible for deductions to zero out a tax bill. The only exception to that uh, is in the context of personal property mobile homes, and we'll talk about that later as well. And it is a universal truth now that for deductions, the applications have to be filled out and signed by December 31st and filed or postmarked by the following January 5th. And that is not changing even though the assessment date is moving from March 1st to January 1st for real property next year. So again, the deadlines will remain the same even though there's a change in the assessment date. All right, so moving into some of the nuts and bolts here of, of the deductions, I'm, I'm just going to go over the most common deductions, give you basic information about them. Again, hopefully this is uh, familiar to you. We start, of course, with the Homestead Standard Deduction, probably the most common or basic of the deductions. And this is the lesser of $45,000 or 60% of the gross assessed value of the property. It applies to the dwelling and those structures such as decks and patios attached to the dwelling and the surrounding acre, even if that acre straddles multiple parcels. So the statute speaks in terms of the dwelling and the surrounding acre. It does not speak in terms of parcels. So if you have two parcels that fall within that acre, and then both parcels would receive the homestead deduction and 1% cap. Now, this applies to property that is the applicant's principal place of residence, meaning the individual's true, fixed, permanent home to which the individual has the intention of returning after an absence. So if somebody is away on business, or they're deployed in the military, or uh, they're on a sabbatical overseas for a year, so long as they have the intention of returning the property after their absence and the property is maintained as their homestead, meaning it's not rented out, they can continue to claim the homestead deduction uh, during their absence. And the applicant must own or be buying the uh, property under recorded contract. It provides that the buyer is responsible for the taxes. Uh, that's, a, again, a pretty universal principle for deductions. There's also a new provision for the homestead deduction, and I think I mentioned it in my uh, the legislation portion of the presentation. But now, uh, if you're buying property under a contract to get the homestead deduction, the contract has to obligate the seller to transfer title to the buyer at the close of the contract. 
Uh, and again, that was effective. That was new legislation this session. Um, old contracts are grandfathered in, so you don't have to go to your recorder's office and start digging through old contracts. Um, it's, it's a perspective uh, change, and we'll talk about that again a little bit later. All right, the supplemental homestead deduction. Any property that receives the standard homestead deduction also receives the supplemental homestead deduction. And this is applied to the net assessed value resulting after the standard homestead deduction is applied to the property. And this deduction equals 35% of the net assessed value if the net is less than 600,000 and then 25% of the net if the net is greater than 600,000. Energy deductions, there are several of these. Uh, solar energy heating or cooling system uh, that uh, deduction equals the out-of-pocket expenditures for the components and labor. Uh, then there's the solar power device, wind power device, hydroelectric device, and geothermal device deduction. And this deduction equals the assessed value of the property with the device, less the assessed value of the property without the device. And in the case of devices that are assessed as personal or distributable property, the deduction equals the assessed value of the device. Now why it is that they have these different values depending on the type of device, it doesn't make any sense, I realize that, but again, that's the way the statutes were written. Uh, we just have to, to try to work with it. Now the hydroelectric and geothermal devices must be certified by the Department of Environmental Management. Uh, if they are certified, once they're certified, a subsequent owner does not need to get them recertified. Now, the subsequent owner would need to apply for the deduction in his own name, but he would not need to recertify the, uh, the device. And I think that was a question that had been submitted here um, even before I got here, there were some questions awaiting me. Uh, do new owners need to file a new application to county and submit info again to IDEM? Uh, if they do, do we just mail a new application to the new owner or do they need to come to the office? So again, once the device has been certified, um, it does not need to be recertified, but the new owner would apply in their own name. All right, the mortgage deduction. Now this deduction is the lesser of $3,000, the balance of the mortgage or contract indebtedness on the assessment date or one half of the total assessed value of the property. Now a person cannot have more than one mortgage deduction in his name. Um, he could split his deduction between a couple of properties if he wanted to. Alternatively, if he's married, um, he could have a full mortgage deduction in his name on one property and his spouse could have a full mortgage deduction in her name on some other property that they own. That would be acceptable. And likewise, if he owns, let's say he owns a business, an LLC, he could have a full mortgage deduction in his name, and then the LLC could have a full mortgage deduction in its name. That would also be acceptable. Now, there, there must be a mortgage balance in place, some indebtedness in place as of the assessment date. Uh, there's no statutory minimum balance. So if the, if the balance is, say, $1,000 on January 1st, 2016, the person could potentially get a $1,000 mortgage deduction for 16 pay 17. Um, and this deduction is available uh, on, uh, with a home equity line of credit, which I think is another way of saying reverse mortgage. This has come up more, recent, more frequently, and recently it seems, I'm getting a lot of questions about this. So again, reverse mortgage I think can qualify for a mortgage deduction, but there still needs to be some kind of indebtedness as of the assessment date. All right. Over 65 deduction. Now, this is, when it comes to deductions, this is definitely more advanced placement or advanced learning deduction. This one's tough. Um, this deduction is the lesser of one half of the gross assessed value of the property, or $12,480. And this can zero, zero out a tax bill. The applicant must have owned or been buying the property for at least one year before claiming the deduction. Now, statute uses this word or this term claiming. What exactly does that mean? Does that mean that you have to own it before, for a year before you apply, or does that mean you have to own it for a year before the deduction shows up on your tax bill? I think there's some ambiguity in the law. Um, I think in the past we have advised that the person should ideally own it for a year before applying for the deduction, but because there's some ambiguity in the law, I think that so long as they've owned it for a year before the deduction shows up on their tax bill, I think that would probably satisfy the statute. Now, the applicant and any joint tenants or tenants in common must reside on the property. Uh, the way the statute is phrased, technically, let's say you have uh, Mrs. Smith uh, who's applying and her husband, Mr. Smith, is in a nursing home. The fact that he's not residing on the property would not disqualify Mrs. Smith from obtaining the deduction. But if Mrs. Smith and her daughter are tenants in common, uh, then Mrs. Smith and her daughter would both need to reside on the property in order for Mrs. Smith to claim the deduction. Again, very convoluted, very difficult, but it is the way the statute is, uh, is written. 
of the combined adjusted gross income of the applicant and applicant's spouse or the applicant and any joint tenants or tenants in common for the preceding year did not exceed $25,000. The assessed value of the property cannot exceed $182,430. The applicant must be at least 65 by December 31st of the year preceding the year in which the deduction is claimed. We've advised that that means that if you want the deduction for 15 pay 16, you have to be at least 65 by December 31st, 2015. Now the same person cannot have the over 65 deduction in conjunction with deductions other than the homestead, mortgage, and believe it or not, the fertilizer storage deductions. So again, if you've got Mr. and Mrs. Smith, uh, Mrs. Smith could claim the over 65 deduction Mr. Smith could claim a disabled vet deduction on the same property, that would be fine. But Mr. Smith could not claim a disabled vet deduction and an over 65 deduction in his own name. That would be a problem. But again, he could claim one deduction, his wife could claim the other. Now the deduction cannot be denied on the basis the recipient is away from the property while in a hospital or a nursing home. So again, if, if Mrs. Smith is receiving this deduction and she ends up having to spend a year in a, a nursing home recovering from surgery or an illness, uh, her deduction cannot be terminated for that reason. Now, if any joint tenants or tenants in common are not at least 65, the deduction is reduced by a fraction. Now again, if you have Mr. and Mrs. Smith, husband and wife, and they own the property, and uh, Mr. Smith is, uh, let's say he's 66, Mrs. Smith is 64, um, he can apply for the deduction and there would be no fractional reduction to his deduction because it's his wife who's not at least 65. But if Mr. Smith and his son own the property as tenants in common and Mr. Smith was 66 and his son was 46, there would be a fractional reduction to that deduction. In that case, it would be a 50% reduction. All right, over 65 circuit breaker. The fun never ends here. Uh, this is a credit, again, this is a credit, not a, this is, there's an over 65 deduction, there's also an over 65 credit, so now we're talking about the credit. The credit prevents the recipient's homestead tax liability from increasing by more than 2% over the previous year. Here the applicant must have been eligible for the homestead deduction in the preceding year as well as the current year. If the applicant filed an individual income tax return for the preceding year, his income cannot have exceeded $30,000 or $40,000 in the case of a joint filing. The gross assessed value of the homestead cannot exceed $160,000. There are no restrictions on combining this credit with other deductions. So again, keep in mind, the over 65 deduction, you know, Mr. Smith, if Mr. Smith's claiming a disabled vet deduction, he can't also claim uh, an over 65 deduction in his name, but he could claim the over 65 credit in his name. Again, I know it makes no sense, it's you know, just counterintuitive, but again, it is the way that these were, were written. Uh, the applicant is or will be at least 65 on, on or before December 31st of the calendar year, immediately preceding the current calendar year again. If you want the credit uh, for 15 pay 16, you'd have to be at least 65 by the end of 2015. So again, the credit and, and the deduction, there are some differences there in terms of the income threshold, the assessed value threshold. The credit applies just to the homestead portion of the property. And, and again, there are some differences in, in the restrictions in combining the, the credit and, and deductions. All right, I think, I think we've earned a little joke uh, to kind of lighten the mood here after talking about all of that. So here we go. So why did the game warden arrest the ghost? You want to take a guess? He didn't have a haunting license. <laughs> They're not going to get any better, so you might as well start laughing. <laughs> all right. It's the blind disabled person deduction. Um, this deduction is worth $12,480. The applicant must use the property as his principal place of residence. The applicant must own or be buying the property in a recorded contract. The applicant must provide proof of blindness or disability. And the applicant's individual income for the preceding year did not exceed $17,000. So in, for this deduction, the income threshold is an individual threshold. So if the person filed jointly with the spouse in the preceding year, somehow the applicant is going to have to break out his or her part of that, of that income. This was a question that came up this year. I have a couple that both applied for the disabled deduction. This will take the value to zero on their primary residence. They have two other parcels. Can you put the rest of the disabled deduction on the other property they own? So again, it, first of all, it is possible for a husband and wife or both of them to receive the, the blind or disabled person deduction. That would be fine. Um, but again, statute speaks in terms of the, the principal residence. So this deduction has to be applied to the, the principal residence of the applicant. Now, here's an interesting brain teaser. You know, 
the blind disabled deduction statute does not use the term homestead. It says principal residence. Now, as I said earlier with the homestead deduction, the homestead deduction is limited to the dwelling and the surrounding acre. Blind disabled deduction says the principal residence. So is it theoretically possible that the person's principal residence could be greater than one acre? In which case, the blind disabled deduction could be applied to that entire piece of property, even though the homestead deduction would be limited just to the dwelling and the surrounding acre. I know it, it's, it's very mind-blowing, but again, just something to keep in mind. Uh, blind disabled deduction is limited just to the principal residence. All right, here's a, a favorite of all auditors, the heritage barn deduction. Uh, this was um, something I think that came out of the 2014 legislative session. Uh, but it was not available until I think 15th pay 16 is the first cycle it's, it's available. Uh, but this is for barns constructed before 1950 that retain sufficient integrity of design materials and construction to clearly identify the building as a barn. Uh, it's not being used for agricultural purposes in the operation of an agricultural, uh, agricultural enterprise and it's not being used for business purpose. Uh, it also cannot be used as a dwelling. So some common questions that have come up here, can the owner store farm equipment in the barn and still qualify for the deduction? And I think if, if you've got a farmer who's maybe storing some personal belongings in the barn, maybe he's got a couple of antique tractors or you know, he's just uh, you know, storing some, some items in there, I think that would be fine. But if he's actually you know, storing uh, equipment that he's using in a current business or agricultural enterprise in the barn, I think that would be a problem. So again, if it's just personal belongings, you know, an old Model T4 that he's going to restore, uh, that's not an issue. But you know, if, if he's still operating a business or an agricultural enterprise and he's using the barn to house his uh, tools and tractors and things, I think that would be more problematic. Now, how many heritage barn deductions can a person receive? It is possible for a person to receive more than one heritage barn deduction. And what about a barn that's been refurbished? This is a very tough question here. I think that if there's still enough of a core heritage barn there, it can probably receive the deduction. If it's been so extensively redone that, 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 that kind of that essential integrity is gone, that, again, that might create more of a problem, but it's going to be a very fact-sensitive case-by-case analysis. And this question about, uh, it had come up, I think maybe last year, about the assessor's office is saying that they have to gather names and other information about uh, heritage barn owners. I'm not seeing anything like that in statute. There is a provision about the, um, I think the, the tourism office has to, to put together some materials to promote heritage barns. But I don't see anything about assessors compiling lists of information, so for what that's worth. Now, disabled vet deductions, I've got a, a section on, on on that topic for a little bit later, so we'll get to that. So here are some, uh, some basic reminders, some basic nuts and bolts. If a deduction is validly in place on the assessment date, it will stay in place for the assessment year, even if the property changes hands or the new owner is uh, ineligible for it. And that's, that's going to be no different, even though the assessment date is moving to January 1st. So again, let's say January 1st, 2016, someone's receiving a homestead deduction, and then a few months later, they uh, move to Alaska. Uh, that homestead deduction, because it was validly in place on the assessment date, will remain in place for 16 pay 17. Uh, even though the person has moved. Now, uh, what if a person has a homestead on his principal place of residence on the assessment date? I think on this slide here it says March 1st, but that'll change January 1st next year. And then they move to a new principal place of residence later that year. Uh, what, what happens then? Well, the deduction on the old house will stay on for that tax cycle, but there is a provision in the law that allows that person to apply for the homestead deduction on the new house that they're moving to. So technically, that person will have two homestead deductions in his name for that one assessment date. That is permissible. For the following assessment date, the deduction would fall off the old house and then remain on the new one. Now, this, this question has come up before. You know, what happens when somebody closes on a property on December 31st, but they don't move in until the following February? Can they still claim the homestead deduction on the property? It's a tough question. I don't think statute explicitly touches on this point. I think we've advised that you know, if you draw certain inferences from the, the statutes, the person probably should use the property as their principal residence uh, during the year for which they're applying. So if they're closing December 31st, you know, if they can move in that day and, and actually use the property as their homestead, even if it's for that one day, that would suffice. If they're not going to move in until the following February, I think that's a, a much tougher call because they're going to be seeking a deduction on a property for a year 
when they never actually use the property as their homestead. So I think that would be more of a, more of a problem. This next slide I've already talked about, uh, so I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna get back into this. This is just about over 65 deduction and, and the restrictions there. Uh, the first bullet point there I, I touched on earlier. Second bullet point there, uh, just a reminder that for 14 pay 15, property must actually be receiving the homestead deduction to receive the 1% cap. As you might recall, for preceding assessment dates, uh, there was an IBTR decision that said that property simply had to be eligible for the deduction to get the 1% cap. A favorite topic of auditors, the uh, Homestead Verification Program. As you know, this program has long since ended. Um, if someone's deduction was terminated for failure to file the pink form and they come into your office tomorrow and show you proof of their eligibility for those tax cycles, the deduction does have to be reinstated and uh, the person could seek a refund but there'd be no interest due. Now, in terms of, of evidence that an auditor can request to uh, verify a person's eligibility, a statute says that the auditor can limit the evidence to a state income tax return, a valid driver's license, or a valid voter registration card that shows the uh, Indiana address for which the deduction is sought. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in another slide or two. In a dispute over, you know, eligibility for one year should probably be, be limited just to that one year instead of saying, well, I want to see, you know, five years worth of, of documentation if there's just one year in, in dispute or one year in question. Uh, the other thing is that, and this comes up somewhat frequently, you know, what discretion or authority does an auditor have to perhaps supplement the, the statutes and, and set up or impose some additional local requirements for applying for a homestead deduction or other deductions? And this is, this is tricky. Um, obviously, auditors are, are in, interested in preventing fraud and duplicate homesteads, and, and we, we certainly appreciate that. I think that's a laudable goal and objective. But there's, there's kind of a, a legal constraint here that statute sets up the eligibility and, and the criteria, the procedures for applying and receiving deductions. So, you know, I don't think unless statute sets up a particular procedure or requirement, I don't think that an auditor can, can supplement or create his or her own additional criteria for applying. So, you know, do keep that in mind. Um, you know, we only have, the, all of us only have the authority that's given to us by statute. And a little free legal advice there, you can't require the submission of, an, of a whole social security number unless you've got the legal authority to do so. It's the last five digits that are actually needed for the homestead deduction. Now, if you have um, two unmarried individuals who both own a property that in one uses it as, as his homestead, he's not precluded from applying for the homestead deduction even though his co-owner receives a homestead deduction on the property where she lives. So I have an example here. You have Bob and Sue who are siblings. They own house A. Bob uses house A as his homestead. Bob can claim a homestead deduction on house A even if Sue claims a homestead deduction on house B which she uses as her homestead. That does not create a problem that is, per that is uh, uh, permissible under state law. All right, driver's licenses. Oh, this is, this is tough here. I've got on this slide excerpts, um, two excerpts from the same statute. And so this is what we, we have to try to make lemonade out of, out of these lemons here. So the one excerpt here, the, the first, the top uh, paragraph there, this is what the, the applicant has to provide on the application form or the sales disclosure form. This is the... Um, the last five digits of the social security number, if they don't have a social security number, the last five digits of the individual's driver's license number. So notice it just says individual's driver's license number. It doesn't say, technically doesn't say Indiana driver's license number. It just says driver's license number. Same statute, second paragraph there, says the auditor may limit the evidence to a state income tax return, a valid driver's license, or a valid voter registration card showing the residence for which the deduction is claimed is the individual's principal place of residence. So there we have the term valid driver's license. We still don't have the, the term Indiana driver's license. So how do we reconcile this now? How do we make this work? I think the idea is that if somebody is applying for the deduction, they can use an out-of-state driver's license in the application for the deduction. And if you think about it, that makes sense because if you can apply through the sales disclosure form, which you can under state law, um, at the time you're doing that, you're probably not going to have an Indiana license yet if you're moving from out of state. You're going to still have your out-of-state license. You're not going to have an Indiana license at that point. 
So I think that the General Assembly probably contemplated that people would be using an out-of-state license on the application. I think that's fine. But if it comes to the point where the auditor is saying, you know what, I'm not sure if this person's really eligible, they've used an out-of-state driver's license, I'm not so sure about this. If the auditor goes to that person and says, hey, I'm, I'm not sure about your eligibility, can you maybe provide some supporting documentation? If pressed, the applicant may have to provide a valid driver's license showing the residence for which they're seeking the, the deduction is their principal residence. Now again, the, the difficulty here is that someone who's just moved from out of state may not have that yet. And so um, maybe they'd have, is it possible they'd have a voter registration card? It's probably still too early for that. Um, but again, this is a little bit tricky here, but again, keep in mind, I think when someone's applying for the deduction through the sales disclosure form or the standard home state application form, they can, they can use the last five digits of an out-of-state driver's license. I think that would be acceptable. But if push comes to shove and there's really a, a doubt about their eligibility, um, you, can, you can limit the evidence to what you request to, again, a valid driver's license showing the uh, Indiana residents for which they're seeking the deduction. This next bullet point here, you know, it is true, a person has 60 days to obtain an Indiana driver's license after becoming a resident of the state. I think a person's failure to do so would not preclude them from uh, being eligible for the homestead deduction. They might be in violation of some BMV rules or the rules of the road or something like that, but that in and of itself would not preclude them from getting a homestead deduction. Again, if, if, they, were, if they were pressed by the auditor, they might have to provide some other kind of, of proof of eligibility, you know, maybe a voter registration card, maybe an income tax return, who knows. Uh, but again, just something to keep in mind. The next few slides, I think for time constraints and because I just I don't want to muddy the waters here, I think I'm going to skip a couple of slides here. Again, nothing, there's nothing really new in the next couple of slides. Um, I think let's move on to uh, slide 30, talk about the much easier topic of uh, divorce. Now, if a couple is legally divorced, the couple is, unless the couple is legally divorced, the couple is still considered married and entitled to only one homestead deduction. Um, and that's true even if the couple is living apart. Now, there is an exception to that in statute, and it's a very narrow exception. If you have one spouse living in Indiana, uh, and he owns the, the property in, in, in only his name and uses it as his homestead, and let's say his spouse lives out of state, and she owns that property in just her name and uses it as her homestead, uh, she can claim a homestead in that state. He can claim a homestead in Indiana. That is possible. That is acceptable. Again, a very narrow exception. Uh, there are some steps that the couple has to take to, to make this, this work. And I have that documented on uh, slides 31 and 32. Now, uh, slide 32, the second bullet point there, question comes up, you know, when does someone have to reapply for a deduction? Um, this, this comes up rather frequently. It, normally, um, the two deductions that come to mind that you'd have to reapply for would be the homestead and the mortgage deduction. If, if you refinance the property, um, you'd have to re reapply for the mortgage deduction. The homestead deduction, um, in cases of marriage or divorce, it'd probably be another time when you'd have to refile the homestead deduction. And there's a provision that's in statute and also the administrative code. It says that an individual who receives a homestead standard deduction for property that is jointly owned with another owner in a particular year and remains eligible for the deduction in the following year is not required to reapply for the deduction following the removal of the joint owner if the individual is awarded sole ownership of property in a divorce decree. It's a mouthful there. So I think, how do you, how do you make this work in, in the real world? I guess if Bob and Sue get divorced, in, let's say it's official in July of 2015. The deduction that was on the property March 1st, 2015, I think would be left in place. That I don't think that would be uh, in jeopardy at all. For the following assessment date, I think what we've advised is that whoever ends up being the owner of the property following the divorce should probably reapply in his or her own name. So let's say that Sue is awarded sole ownership of the property um, and she's the exclusive owner as of January 1st, 2016. I think for 16 pay 17, it would be ideal if she came in and reapplied in just her name for the homestead deduction. You know, but trying to, to understand or interpret this provision of the statute, if she didn't come in, if, if the property was, um, you know, if, if the property was in her name, but she didn't come in to, to reapply and the old deduction was still on, would that necessarily be problematic? 
Maybe not. I mean, I, I think this provision might afford that situation of, of some protection, but again, I think it'd be cleanest if she came in and reapplied in just her name, because if you think about it, the, the old homestead deduction is going to be tied to both a Sue and Bob, and so if Bob goes out and buys a property in his name and applies for the homestead, um, he might be flagged because his name's already in the, in the database. So again, that's why it'd be cleaner if she came in and, and applied in her own name. All right, uh, this slide touches on the, the issue of how much due diligence does an auditor have to do before terminating a deduction? Obviously, under state law, it's legally the obligation of the property owner to notify the auditor if they're ineligible for a deduction. Uh, but you know, here's a situation, you know, I, the auditor is asking, I received a letter from a taxpayer saying they had moved, this, they, they received this letter in December, and they'd like their mail forwarded to a new address. Should I pull that person's homestead deduction for the preceding assessment date? And I think here in this situation, we don't have enough information. Uh, we don't know when the person moved. If they moved after March 1st, then that deduction can be left in place for that tax cycle. If they had moved in February, though, then the deduction probably should be removed for that assessment date. But we just don't know. We don't have enough information here. So I think the auditor in this situation has maybe two options, either err on the side of safety and just leave the deduction in place for that assessment date, or the auditor can try to follow up with the taxpayer and inquire. And again, yes, I realize it's technically the taxpayer's obligation to notify the auditor, uh, but again, this person may in fact be eligible for that deduction for that assessment date and it would be inappropriate to, to pull it. All right, now before we get into this next topic, I think we need a, a little bit of a laugh here. I think we need to kind of relax a bit. Uh, so who did the ghost invite to his party? Anyone he could dig up. Now, the assessors would have found that funny. <laughs> All right, so the income thresholds for the over 65 deduction and the blind disabled deductions. I mentioned uh, this earlier, but I think it's worth uh, drilling down a little bit more into this, into this uh, subject matter. So first um, paragraph there, I've, I already touched on earlier about the uh, $25,000 income threshold. Second paragraph there is, is very important for the over 65 deduction. The statute says that the applicant shall submit for inspection by the county auditor a copy of the applicant's, a copy of the applicant's spouse's income tax returns for the preceding calendar year. If either was not required to file an income tax return, the applicant shall subscribe to that fact in the deduction statement. So this is one situation where an applicant does have to provide some supplemental documentation with the application. And, and technically, statute says that the applicant shall submit for inspection a copy of their income tax return. Technically, I don't think that they're obligated to permanently turn over to you a copy of their income tax return. I think they could go up to your, your clerk's uh, window, show them a copy of their income tax return, have the clerk make a notation, and they could take it back with them. Obviously, folks are going to be sensitive about releasing that uh, kind of information uh, permanently. So I think if they show it to you, you verify it, I think they can take it back. I think that satisfies the statute. And again, if they weren't required to file an income tax return in the preceding year, I think all they have to do is probably handwrite something to that effect on the application and, and just sign the application. Now, the over 65 credit, I, I talked about this earlier, the 30,000 uh, threshold for the individual filer, 40,000 for a joint filing. The uh, blind disabled deduction, again, individual income, $17,000 threshold. The blind disabled deduction statute has this interesting provision here. It says, for purposes of this section, taxable gross income does not include income which is not taxed under the federal income tax laws. That same provision does not appear in the over 65 deduction statute, but we've advised that for purposes of both deductions, uh, you'd only look at or count income subject to federal income taxes toward the, the threshold. Now, Something else that's interesting here is that only the over 65 deduction and credit require the applicant to show you a copy of their income tax return. The blind disabled deduction does not obligate the applicant to show you a copy of their income tax return. Now, why is that? I know it doesn't make any sense. It would be helpful if statute did, but technically it does not. So this gets us back into that question of you know, how much discretion does an auditor have to sort of supplement or fill in gaps. I think, you know, if you have an applicant for the, over, for the blind disabled deduction, I think you could ask if they'd be willing to show you a copy of their income tax return so you can verify their income, but you can't force them to, to show you a copy of their income tax return. If they, if they refuse, you can't deny the deduction just on that basis. 
Um, so again, you could, you could request if they'd be willing to. If they refuse, you can't tell them, well, I'm sorry, I can't accept your application, or I'm going to deny your application for that reason. Now, trusts. Uh, trusts can receive certain deductions. Uh, over 65, blind, disabled, partially disabled veteran, totally disabled veteran, and homestead deduction. Basically, it's, it's the person with a beneficial interest in the trust who can potentially receive the deduction. So again, the, the property would be owned by the trust. Uh, the, the person with the beneficial interest would be the one applying for the deduction. And, and that person may or may not be the trustee. Um, it's, it's not so much about the trustee, it's about the person with the beneficial interest. Another question that had come up uh, earlier this year, can our county collect on inel ineligible deductions other than the homestead deduction? Well, there is a statutory provision for collecting on ineligible homestead deductions, uh, which I'll mention in another slide or two. Uh, there's no similar statutory mechanism for collecting on other types of ineligible deductions. I think a county would probably have to take that person to court uh, to try to collect. So if somebody had been receiving a disabled vet deduction for the last 10 years that they weren't actually entitled to, if the county wanted to try to recover that money, I think they'd have to take the person to court. There's no statutory mechanism uh, to collect those taxes as there is for the homestead deduction. Now, when, uh, when does uh, an auditor have to notify a person that their deduction has been denied or terminated? I think the only two circumstances that come to mind, first with the back, getting back to the homestead verification program before terminating a deduction for failure to file the pink form, auditor had to notify the, the taxpayer. Um, the other situation is where somebody submits an initial application for a homestead deduction and the auditor denies it. The auditor does have to provide notice to that applicant and inform them of their appeal rights. And I will say, um, DLGF's position would be that uh, PETA-BOAs can and must um, hear appeals concerning property tax deductions. So if a deduction has been denied or terminated, um, whether it's a homestead, a disabled vet, a mortgage, uh, Peter Boa can and must hear those appeals. The, the taxpayer would file a Form 133 correction of error, and if the auditor and assessor don't both agree that a correction is warranted, then it goes to the Peter Boa. All right, now here's the uh, ineligible homestead deduction statute, and I have some, uh, some things highlighted in red here. So under the current statute, uh, each county auditor that makes a determination that property was not eligible for a standard deduction in a particular year shall notify the county treasurer of the determination and do one or more of the following. Make a notation on the tax duplicate that the property is ineligible for the deduction and indicate the date the notation is made and or record a notice of an ineligible homestead lien. And again, I think the, the purpose behind this, this was, I think this was added in 2013, I want to say, and I think the purpose for this was to put subsequent buyers of the property on notice that there may be some uh, tax liability that's associated with the property and that there may not be a homestead carryover for them. Now also notice there, um, the um, county auditor shall issue a notice of taxes, interest, and penalties due to the owner that improperly received the standard deduction um, and include a statement that the payment is to be made within 30 days. So I think under the old version of the statute, you would send that notice to the whoever was the current owner. Um, under this, the current language here of the statute, you send that notice to the person who actually improperly received the deduction. Again, I think that was intended to protect innocent buyers um, who came along after, afterwards. All right, veteran deductions. By the way, what happened when the ghost asked for a whiskey at his local bar? The bartender said, sorry, sir, we don't serve spirits here. <laughs> All right. All right. Now, I think the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs has discontinued the use of the codes. Um, the codes were never a part of the deduction statutes. They were used, I think, to classify vets based on their, their disabilities. Uh, there are two primary disabled vet deductions available. The first is for vets with a partial disability. This deduction is worth $24,960, and this is for vets uh, who served during wartime and have a service-connected disability of at least 10%. Obviously, they have to provide proof of their disability, and, and they have to own or be buying the property in a recorded contract. The other main disabled vet deduction is for vets who are either totally disabled or who are at least 62 years of age with a disability of at least 10%. This deduction is worth 
And here the, the vet did not have to serve during wartime, nor does he have to have a service-connected disability. So he had, to, he had to serve for at least 90 days, and again, um, the disability does not need to be service-connected. So again, why, why the amounts of the deduction are different, I don't know, but that is, that is what statute says. Now something that's very important about the totally disabled vet deduction is that there's an, there's an assessed value threshold or cap. So no one is entitled to the totally disabled vet deduction if the assessed value of the individual's tangible property as shown by the tax duplicate exceeds $143,160. And that would cover all of the vet's property, real and personal. The disabled vet deductions can be applied to any real or personal property that the vet owns or is buying under contract. It's not limited just to his residence. Um, if he owns a house, but he also owns some depreciable personal property, he can have the deduction apply just to that personal property in, instead of the, the residence. Um, you know, if, if he owns a house out of state, I don't think that you would consider that assessed value. It's only the Indiana property that he owns. All right. Let's skip to slide 52 here. Surviving spouses of a vet uh, can claim these deductions. Um, and that's true regardless of whether the property for which the deduction is claimed was owned by the deceased veteran or the surviving spouse before the deceased veteran's death. Uh, obviously, the, the surviving spouse would have to provide all the documentation necessary to establish that the deceased veteran would have, applied, or would have qualified for the deduction. Uh, this is my la the last time I'll ever be able to use this joke. You know, if you have someone coming into your office claiming to be a World War I vet, don't call me, call the Ghostbusters. The World War I vet deduction is being sunsetted uh, January 1, 2016. Interestingly, though, the deduction for surviving spouses of World War I vet veterans is not being sunsetted. So I guess if you have you know, a little old lady who comes in, claims to have married, you know, been a surviving spouse of a World War I vet, I guess she could still qualify uh, next year. So. All right, excise taxes. Another favorite topic here. As I said earlier, um, if there's an unused portion of a disabled vet deduction remaining after it's been applied to property, uh, the vet can receive an excise tax credit. And there are, there are basically two paths that a vet can, can go down when it comes to excise taxes. So the first path is for a vet who qualifies for and receives a disabled vet property tax deduction. The deduction is applied to his property and he has an unused portion remaining. He would come into your office and you would fill out, I think it's the 128 VET form, um, you would indicate or calculate the amount of credit that he's uh, owed. You would take that to the BMV, and that's the way that's been working for years and years. Nothing's changed there. The other path that a vet can take is, is for a vet who does not own or is not buying property that qualifies for a disabled vet property tax deduction. So this would be, for instance, a vet who's renting an apartment. He doesn't own any property. Or it could be a vet, uh, let's say he's a vet, he owns a, a million dollar house, uh, but he did not serve during wartime. He doesn't have a service-connected disability. So he would be disqualified for both of the property tax deductions, one, because his assessed value is too high, and two, because he doesn't have a service-connected disability. So in that case, that vet could also uh, go to the auditor's office and receive from you an affidavit uh, affirming that he does not own or is not buying property that qualifies for a property disabled vet property tax deduction. He would take that affidavit to the BMV, fill out a BMV form, and then receive a credit through the BMV. I think it's the lesser of $70 or the excise tax due um, up to two vehicles. Now, we did prescribe a, a sample affidavit that you can use. It's on our website. You don't have to use that. It's not an official state form, but it's there to help you if, if you'd like to use it. Now, this was an interesting uh, brain teaser that had come up. Um, and I don't know, uh, ooh, I'm kind of running over here. I guess I better speed it up here. Um, I'll just, I'll leave you to read slide 56 kind of on, on your own time. I don't want to eat up too much time there. I, I, I talked about this back in spring, so um, but just kind of an interesting brain teaser there. A vet can, can receive no more than one of each type of, of uh, deduction, uh, but he can split it between properties in, in different counties. That is fine. He should apply in whichever counties he wants the deduction, and the counties would work together to split that deduction between those properties. If two, own, two vets own a property, both can uh, receive the deductions. That's not a problem. There are no combination restrictions there. Uh, 
Now, mobile homes, I've talked about this the last couple of years, so again, I'll try to, to maybe breeze through this a little bit more, but bottom line here is that um, personal property mobile home, the assessed value of that personal property mobile home cannot be reduced by more than 50% by deductions, except for the supplemental homestead deduction. That can reduce the assessed value by more than half. Um, so it's tricky trying to reconcile that restriction in law with the homestead deduction statute, which, again, is the lesser of $45,000 or 60% of the assessed value. So we put together what I hope is maybe a helpful slide here that kind of shows you how that might work. Uh, now, this particular hypothetical assumes that the same person owns the mobile home and the land it sits on. Um, but again, bottom line is that there, there may simply be a limit to how much a reduction a person can get in their personal property mobile home assessed value um, but you know if they also own the land that it sits on you know the, the land AV could theoretically be zeroed out so just something to keep in mind there all right let me jump into legislative changes and for any of you lawyers out there why did the zombie lose his lawsuit well he had no leg to stand on <laughs> supposed to be laughing harder as we go along. We're getting toward the end of the presentation. Legislative changes. House and Rule Act 1283. I mentioned this uh, earlier. This is about uh, the, uh, if you're buying property in a recorded contract and you want the homestead deduction, the contract has to obligate the seller to transfer title at the close of the contract. Again, that amendment was effective April 15th, so old contracts are grandfathered in. Senate Rule Act 372 um, kind of clears up a, uh, a little bit of a exception to an exception that was in, in the homestead deduction statute. So again, if, you're, if you move from your homestead after the assessment date to a new homestead, you can have the deduction on both properties for just that one assessment date. I mentioned the World War I vet deduction being uh, uh, eliminated next year. Let's see. Oh, I think I confused my, uh, my bills there. 372 is saying that if more than one individual or entity qualifies property as a homestead, only one deduction, only one homestead deduction can be applied to the property. So getting back to that example I mentioned, you know, Bob and Sue are siblings and they both own the house and they both use it as their homestead. Um, only Bob or Sue could get the homestead on that property. They, they couldn't both get a homestead on that same property. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, 1388, uh, that, that was the, the cleanup that I mentioned earlier about getting rid of the exception to the exception. Um, there is also in that same bill an exemption for common areas that's probably more relevant to assessors. Uh, and there's also an exemption, this is Senate Rule Act 436, for certain basements and special flood hazard areas, again, probably more relevant to assessors. Senate Rule Act 436 created this uh, property tax disclosure form. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about it because I would advise you not to, to do much with this. I think uh, there's already plans to eliminate this next session. Apparently it was left in the bill by accident to begin with, um, so it was never meant to be passed into law. So um, let's just skip that for the, the time being. But um, Senate Rule Act 420, keep in mind that starting next year, if an exemption is validly in place on the assessment date. It remains in place for that tax cycle, even if the property's use or ownership changes later that year. So starting next year, exemptions will be treated very much like deductions. If they're validly in place as of the assessment date, they remain in place for that tax cycle. And that is a departure from the way exemptions are treated right now. All right, I think we'll wrap up with some sales disclosure form issues. We are looking at uh, some revisions to the sales disclosure form. Uh, we've not finalized anything yet. You know, we're, this is probably still another year or two out. Um, it's, there are a lot of moving parts that have to be aligned. So, uh, but we are looking at some revisions. We've, last summer, we reached out to a few different uh, stakeholders and solicited some feedback. And a common complaint was about inconsistency in the way the form is handled, uh, in large part with, with deductions uh, being an issue. Uh, one, one question, can we make every person recording a deed file a sales disclosure form? And the answer would be no. The sales disclosure form is triggered only under certain circumstances. You can't just have a blanket shotgun approach where you know, every time you file a deed, you've got to fill out a sales disclosure form. You know, could a county develop its own form that it uses for bookkeeping or, or tracking purposes? That might be possible under the, under the home rule provisions, but you couldn't just take our sales disclosure form and take the state seal off and pass it off as your own. It would have to be your own 
form, hopefully something a lot less cumbersome than the sales disclosure form. And only the, the sales disclosure forms, the official ones, can be used for trending purposes. Um, again, a lot of this, you know, I'll, I'll kind of leave to you to, to look over, and, and because we haven't really finalized a new form yet, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds. Some of this could, could change or be updated, and certainly once we do get a new form um, out for release, um, we'll, we'll have trainings and presentations on it. So, again, I'll kind of leave a lot of this to you to, to read. I don't want to uh, eat too much into Dan's time. I know you're anxious to, to hear from him. Um, I'm just going to flip through these slides here. See if there's anything else that's really relevant here. Okay. Now this, um, I will mention this, there was this, the language you see in red there was added in 2014, but it was removed in 2015, I think at the, at the behest of, of auditors. Um, I don't know if it means much to you or you really care about it, but I just thought I would put it out there just so you're aware of that. Um, one thing, it, it's not in, in this presentation, I did want to remind you that um, there is a deadline to publish abatement information uh, it's going to be published by uh, December 31st. We do have um, an upload tool through Gateway on that, but uh, I was asked to, to remind you all while I was here. So again, if you have any questions about that, you can, you can reach out to us. We did, we'll probably issue a, a reminder memo about it, but we did put one out last year. But uh, just keep that in mind that you do have to publish certain information about abatements that have been granted um, during, during the year. It is my contact information. I'll. Um, uh, I'll be out at the table for maybe, I don't know, the next 20 minutes or so if you have any questions to, uh, to reach me. Uh, but I appreciate your time. I've got a couple other questions that were um, submitted before I got here. Are we going to get new forms for deductions, exemptions, since the assessment date is changing? Um, yes, we are working on updating our forms um, and making those tweaks, so those should be out uh, pretty soon. Uh, another question, when a form is filed out, filled out by a title company or bank, are they required to give us the information about a homestead that is vacated? What about the signature and information of the untitled spouse? Um, if, the, if the buyer is applying for a homestead deduction through the form, they do have to indicate if they're vacating um, another homestead. Although, again, keep in mind, if they're moving from Indiana to Indiana, they can have the homestead on both properties for that one assessment date. Um, if the if the buyers, if the husband and wife are buyers and are applying for the homestead deduction, both spouses' information does need to be included on the sales disclosure form, um, even if one of the spouses is not going to be on the deed of the property. So if Bob and Sue are buying property um, and applying for the homestead deduction, even if Bob is the only one who's going to be on the, on the deed, he'd still have to include Sue's information on the uh, sales disclosure form. Um, and with that, I will leave you with this uh, zinger here. Why was the zombie happy to be in court? He was hoping the judge would give him a new life sentence. You could humor me a little bit more, you know, and make me feel better. So, all right, well, thanks so much.